Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Shea. I am, uh, it is my honor to host uh, today's uh, session regarding the evolution of VCs and that, how that affects you. I chose this topic specifically, wanted to uh, tap into the heart and also the, the thinkings of, yeah, I'm right now on the spotlight, right? Yeah. I'm the star of the day. Yeah. To get it to I'll just stand here for now so that you guys can see who we, who, who we have. And the, the purpose of having the panel is uh, for entrepreneur, fellow entrepreneurs and also fellow investors to feel the evolution that had taken place over the 20, uh, last 20 years. I, I got involved in the, about 20 years ago. And there has been a lot of changes in the dynamics of Silicon Valley, and I think more changes are also going to come. And uh, we'd like to... Uh, uh, have, a, have a way for us as investors to be able to deal and also maneuver the changes and also have entrepreneurs who want to have an opportunity to work with uh, other investors to see what model you should be seeking and who you should be working with. And uh, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic to my fellow panelists for them to make a short introduction to themselves. So uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, my name is Ella Lee, and I'm the Senior Investment Director from uh, CGC Capital. Uh, so a little bit of introduction about who we are. Uh, we are the subsidiary of uh, Zhongguancun Developing Group uh, that oversees Zhongguancun Scientific Park, which is also the largest scientific park in China, uh, and also is uh, called uh, China's Silicon Valley. So under our parent company, we perform under uh, Investment Plus Incubator Program by providing investment and also incubator uh, services to uh, the uh, local innovation community. So in addition, we also uh, provide cross-border services to US and also uh, Chinese uh, companies. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kyle Sterling, and I'm based here in California. And I have a kind of a hybrid life. I do some stuff with university and many other things with entrepreneurs here in the area. I'm an advisor to several companies. One of them was the last one that presented here called uh, Diagnose Early. And um, I like to work with early stage companies. Um, that's when things are not quite fixed yet and there's a lot of opportunity to really help out. Hi uh, everyone, uh, my name is Eugene Zhang, Zhang Yuqing. I represent a fund, a uh, macro VC fund called uh, Teak Angel Fund. Uh, our fourth fund is called a TSVC. We decided to drop the angel, but we are still uh, an early stage seed fund. Uh, it all, we have been operating in Silicon Valley uh, for uh, now uh, nine years. Uh, with uh, a very extremely lucky, we have hit uh, you know four unicorns, uh, including one recently went public company called Zoom. Everybody is using it. Uh, so. Uh, and uh, we focus on technology-based company start startups. Uh, we are located in Los Altos. Uh, we, uh, you know, help uh, help or invest, uh, you know, in early uh, seed companies. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Holland. I'm a general partner at Foundation Capital. Uh, Foundation is a 23-year-old firm. Uh, we've taken about three billion dollars from investors. And so far, I've turned that into about $300 billion of outcomes. Um, about half of that is Netflix, but there's a bunch of other good companies that are in there other than Netflix. Uh, I spent my operating career helping to start two software companies, one with Reed Hastings, a company called Pure Software, and then another with Mark Ganey and Michael Horvath, uh, who then went on to do Strava, and that company was called Kana Communications. I did both of those companies working with partners from uh, Benchmark Capital. Great company. Bunny used to be a member. Uh, yeah, uh, Foundation Capital. I have two hats. I'm founder and CEO of Kretzer Forum. Um, we're a global angel network. We have 53 locations, and I have licensed the uh, rights and ownership uh, around the world. We have 1,400 fundings, and we're obviously very early stage. Most of the companies come to us do have, obviously, traction in the marketplace. And we hopefully exit through Foundation Capital. Government uh, of China has invited me over several times to Z Park to speak, so I love going over to Z Park also. Also, another hat is um, I'm GP with the other two, two GPs. We have 100 million AUM. We have seven different funds from blockchain to real estate, topping off our best deal flow around the world. And the reason I'm here is we're in Singapore, we're in Korea, um, we're in India, but. Uh, 
Um, sorry to say, my chapter president passed uh, several years ago. And I want to re-enter re China, and we were there for 10 years. So I think the world's flat. I love deal flow all around the world, and don't want to be precocious thinking we have the best deal flow here. Our corporate headquarters are in San Francisco, but I like to see, obviously, great entrepreneurs around the world. Great. Thank you. Um, I forgot to introduce myself, Peter Shea, general partner of Acorn Pacific Ventures. Um, just a brief on the resume. 97 till 04, I was doing semiconductor and fiber optics related investment here. I've had several M&As and also several IPOs. Um, 04 till 13, I was doing venture capital in Beijing, mostly growth stage. My hit rate in China, of course, it was good timing. It was 100%, and uh, that was really nice. Um, then I went back to Taiwan to work as a CEO of a public company for three, uh, two years. Three years ago, I moved back to Silicon Valley for my kids' education. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've been around and look at different sectors like semiconductor, fiber optics, internet, mobile, retail, manufacturing, you name it, I have done that. Yeah. And also even taken company private instead of public as well. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I want to start with uh, the first question of today. It's, um, this is actually a reflection of myself, and also I think the venture capitalists uh, here today also have some different perspective. Back 21 years ago when I got started, I saw my partners uh, entering board meetings and sharing all their advices with the entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs would say, great, yes. Oh, you are so smart and full of wisdom. But when it was my turn to give advice, I think they said, yes, you're so great. But the next board meeting, they did not act upon what, whatever I told them, right? Uh, I, I think entrepreneurs must see a lot of these uh, VCs that some you respect and some you don't, to be honest. Some you only respect because they bring money to the table. I would like the fellow panelists to, to think about uh, and reflect on their self, their experiences. Who do you think the entrepreneur should uh, partner with? Uh, the ones with experience or the ones that have money but uh, decided to stand on the sideline just to let you play your role. And uh, if we could uh, start with uh, Randy, yeah. Um, I love the whole ecosystem of the startup infrastructure. I, my wife and I have made 55 investments at Crest. And one of the great, great criteriums to, you know, to, to drill down to your question is, do I respect the entrepreneur? Will he listen or she listen to what we, and we want to give resources. It's not advice. I mean, we're not going to fund a company if they don't get it. And so if they receive the resource and do something with it, that I want to invest. Now, personally, when I invest, I invest milestones. So let's say I have a $500,000 commitment. I will only give 100000 And if they don't get those resources and, and grab the resources that we're providing, and we're fortunately have 3,600 members around the world, and we encourage our companies uh, to obviously, you know, garner those resources. So number one, I have to really, really enjoy the CEO, you know, obviously man or woman, and I really want to, you know, uh, uh, see if they receive the knowledge and see receive the resources. We had I, was anybody in the room at our large event in San Francisco last week? I had um, I had a CEO of Safara, which we t we we, we, uh, we rang the bell la four months ago, and he took all the resources. A four hundred million dollar company today, and he came to us at pre was under ten million, but we gave him tons of resources. As it's, a, it's, a, it's a company solving uh, MRSA issues, young kids with cystic fibrosis around the world. And he took those resources, now he's a public company. And so if they're receptive to the resources, then I'll do business with them. Sounds good. Because you're senior enough, you think your advice is actually worth something well, to them. Think, I don't think my advice is worth something. I think my contacts are worth something. Great, great. I, I just want us to be also cognitive. Um, we have 50 minutes for our panel. We have six people. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think when I think about board activity and, uh, and working on my boards, I, I don't think of it as so much advice. I think of it as work, right? So I have one board now that has six executives, and I personally recruited four of the six executives. So um, when I was first starting out, Andy Ratcliffe was my venture capitalist, and he described it to me as recruiting is your number one priority to a young entrepreneur, right? Once they get the money, they need help. They got to scale, and then they have to have really strong people around them. I experienced that with Reed Hastings, that's what Andy did on that board, and then I've tried to emulate that in terms of other places. Second part, quick answer to that is uh, about seven years ago I made a movie called Something Ventured. Um, it's about the origins of the Silicon Valley and about how Apple got funded and Intel got funded. 
And one of the things I felt like I learned from those, you know, kind of legendary venture capitalists, the Arthur Rock and Don Valentine's of the world, is that you have to adjust and work with a lot of different kinds of entrepreneurs, right? Cisco became one of Don's biggest hits, and obviously he fired the founder and had a big row associated with that. So you just have to be kind of prepared. You don't know what you're going to get when you get started on a board, and you have to be nimble and prepared to do whatever it takes to try to make the company successful. Sometimes that means taking the CEO aside and putting in somebody else, and sometimes it's just simply supporting the CEO until the end. Great. Um, yeah, t t uh, perfect you know, timing to segue uh, you know, from my personal experiences and also Paul just uh, mentioned uh, during my days raising money, um, you know, it's very common in such a setup, you know, the, the VC come in and, you know, some VC say, yeah, you know, usually many times the founder become uh, growing uh, like a bottleneck. Very, very much true in Cisco's case, the couple uh, were later on maybe uh, re resign or let go. And you have today's, uh, you know, 19, when I joined Cisco 1995, was every six months stock double, you know, and then you split, then you double. It's just amazing. Without, uh, you know, the, the funding team, uh, you know, uh, in the company, that's become possible. But uh, quickly coming to today, you know, from our, our days to be an investor in the last nine years, things change so much. You know, we, uh, you, you heard about entrepreneur-friendly theme, right? So the VC come in, just coming to help you. Uh, uh, you know, the thesis is if um, the way to uh, helping uh, a founder with vision, to help him to equip with the management skills, it is a much easier task than have a professional MBA come to the CEO and insert, let him, force him to learn product vision, company vision, it's very different uh, difficulty levels. That's why you, you heard about in the last 10 years, people say, you know, the pre uh, past model is, didn't work, we should all support an entrepreneur. I think of the real, really the reality or it's case by case, right? Each, you know, there's always, uh, it depends. I think that's my personal view, but dominantly, I think uh, the the trend is moving towards supporting the entrepreneur and help the original founder to be a successful uh, founder, you know, the Steve Jobs, all, all, all that. Uh, from my personal experience in uh, investing in over 150 companies, you know, we are kind of extremely lucky. We have four uh, companies hitting unicorn status. Um, um, and then versus and also some companies I spend a lot of time. I think there's no uh, direct a correlation between the time you spend in versus the, the 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 return. So we always make ourselves available to help on all fronts, recruiting, including, and also help introduce early uh, later investors. As we are seed investors, so it's a lot of work is to help bridging the next round investors. That's important work. Um, sometimes we sit, I sit on the board, but the key is to the entrepreneur. They have to list to listen. They have their own ideas. If they every 100% listen to you, <laughs> that's not a good sign. <laughs> but uh, but it has its own. But uh, if the person does not listen at all, uh, okay. So then you cannot force. So so I think uh, it's all over the place. It person entrepreneur by entrepreneur. The best case is you find the right seed. They know it all. They once a while they ask you a few questions. You you provide your input. Then they take it or not taking it or say, oh, that's actually exactly what I want, I don't want to do. Okay. But say, you know, something like that. Okay. Yeah, so this is a really interesting topic, and I think the short answer is it's all about the people. And if you take a fund's money, the company is not your own anymore. You know, you have ownership by somebody else, and so you have a duty and an obligation to be open receptive, responsive. You can reject if you want to, but it's a two-way street. And everybody you meet knows something you don't know. And they've had some experiences you haven't had. And so maybe you can share some of your insights with your investors or board members and bring them up. But it, it really goes both ways. And being an entrepreneur means you don't know. You've got a hypothesis. You're out there trying to figure it out and test it with investors, with customers. And so if you're not open, you're going to miss the big opportunity. Yeah. 
so I think I can answer this also from entrepreneur's uh, perspective. So uh, when you look for, for instance, like a funding and also partners that uh, you want to sit in your board for the next couple of years, there are some rules you want to follow. The, the rule number one is you want to always go with the highest tier of VC as you can, but just uh, keep in mind, do not go overboard. So after this uh, capital, the most, uh, the most very valuable asset for this VC is their credibility. So a really renowned institute with a deep, deep pocket can really back your company and help your company to uh, grow. Um, but do not uh, like also overanalyzing that since the ranking of all this VC also change all the time because of the good and also bad exit years. So the second rule is partner is very important. You want to look for the right partners who, for instance, want to, uh, uh, if they invest you, it's not because you are the hard deal, but is because they are a truly believer of what you do. Just remember, they're gonna sit in your board of the company for years and give you really important advice to about how to grow your company and how to expand your company. So you really want to work with them. So another rule is you want to choose a partner that is like a soft opinion uh, advisor or investor. So you want to get their advice, but you don't really want to be pushed by them. Like you have to, go with our way. So you want them to also respect your decision while giving you the advice. So so, so just like the take home message is uh, when you do like looking for, uh, let's say the, the VC, uh, when you have this uh, uh, like a luxury to choose then you want to first do the reference check with them just like uh, how they do the reference check with you. So picking up the right partner will be where this investor is really important and can make your personal journey much, much more smoother. Uh, these are all great, great answers. I just want to point out some complexity. There's definitely no good answer because you're not going to be dealing with one VC investor. On your board, if your company keeps growing, you'll have different VC investors coming in when the company's still private or even when the company's public. Then each different class of shares have fundamentally some different rights and their demands. So there is going to be conflict of interest between them. So I will be fighting for my class. You will be fighting for your class. Just a most recent example, when Yero got acquired by Amazon, you guys all saw the news three weeks ago. Most of the investors didn't make money. Only the founders make money. Employees didn't make money either. So when a company is called quote unquote successful, it doesn't mean everyone is a winner. Yeah, think about that. And find the, the guys like these people that are sitting on the panel that are mature enough to be willing to work with the entrepreneur and also work with each other. I think that's very important. Yeah, um, I, I would like to uh, uh, switch the topic over to the, the, the next question uh, because uh, our dear friend Eugene keeps on saying that he has four unicorns, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So and uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about unicorn. I was doing some research recently. Um, currently, there are about uh, a little bit over 300 unicorns in the world. Um, on average, each company raised about uh, 800 something million dollars to become a unicorn. 800! Yeah. And of the 300 something unicorns, uh, about uh, half of those are born and raised here in the United States. But if you want to look for capital efficiency, like Eugene is, look at the companies that have raised less than a hundred million dollars that still became unicorn or is a unicorn today, there are only 16 of them out of the 300 something universe. And of the 16 unicorns that have raised less than a hundred million dollars, six are in China, three are here in the US, two in South Korea, the rest are in Israel, Australia, Philippines, and Indonesia. Which means US doesn't seem to be so capital efficient anymore, right? So I would like to take on uh, the panelists' wisdom as to should entrepreneurs today still think about uh, creating unicorns or are VCs still chasing unicorns? Um, I, I know you have another topic you're interested in, so we'll skip you. And uh, if you want to take the mic, yeah, maybe we have three of the panelists answering the question, I think. And Eugene, by default, you have to answer it. Yeah. I, I think we're into an interesting time where maybe we'll have unicorn burgers eventually. <laughs> okay. Are you, that's it? Okay. 
So well, Beyond, that, that Beyond like meat, meat company is Beyond about meat, to go public, Beyond right? Meat, yeah, yeah, Beyond, Beyond meat, meat, just yeah. yeah. So I think Peter, you you are very good at, at data insights. Um, but as an investor, um, I think uh, yeah, um, yeah, we definitely although we. Early days, we call ourselves a super angel uh, now, you know, whatever, micro VC, but uh, we we're definitely still looking for potential, very big uh, potentials. You are on a very good point that uh, capital efficiency, like a, a company, you know, I, it's not our portfolio. I don't uh, want to promote, you know, only our company, but call it Flexport, right? They are the only very young company. I met the founder, you know, you know, regret we didn't put in money. But after four years, yeah, they they raised uh, one billion dollar from a uh, soft uh, soft bank vision fund. So that tells uh, things are very different. I think uh, you know in the in the valley, uh, we are small fund, so we not much impacted. But a bigger billion dollar fund, definitely, uh, the game is very different. Um, I think the quickest summary I think is uh, the A B C D rounds. Usually you wait for milestone to put a B round, looking for next milestone to put a B round. But if you really believe that is the company already have enough, that would be a huge hit. Then you want to say, I want to put in. The when you say you, you mean an investor, right? It's an investor, yeah. Right. So put it in. And I think I can understand that, you know, for a company like, uh, uh, I don't want to promote, but yeah, it's once you read it, you definitely, if I were, were I have one billion dollar, Three months ago, I would put in the same amount of money. Clearly, one VC pulled the trigger, do the did the same thing. So that's kind of a, I think uh, yeah. You early mentioned changes. It's clearly uh, I think it's yeah. Really, uh, Eugene, you give me eight hundred million dollars, I'll create a unicorn for you. Okay. <laughs> in three years, company just by doing CD in the bank or wow. buying mutual fund. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, you uh, you you <laughs> definitely get scared, right? So if you put money in one company, that kind of so if they have a conviction. Definitely, that's the game right now. So you're putting a lot of one, starting with 100 million dollars. Okay, let's hear a foundation story because you guys definitely have a lot of them under your belt. Yeah. yeah so um, that, uh, I, the t the t title of the panel is VC Evolution, and so um, yes. when I I I think about sort of if I go back to what we were trying to chronicle with something ventured, what we were really doing was capturing what I would call the dreamers. Like these were people that were originating new markets semiconductors, uh, lasers, um, biotechnology, video games, right? The market size of those, of those markets was zero at the time the investments occurred because they didn't exist. And so um, what I wrote a piece for Huffington Post a few years ago called The Disruptors, right? So moving from dreamers to disruptors. And really to me, that's as, as, as good an explanation as I can give you for what's changed in the venture industry and really private equity industry which is that before we had people that were creating these new markets, like Reed Hastings working on uh, pure software, right? Trying to fix software quality, that was our big thing. And we got the company to two, three billion dollars in market cap, so it was pretty good. But then he decided he wanted to blow up one of the trillion dollar industries in the world, the media industry. And so, um, you know, we were fortunate. We owned 11.1% of the company at one point, so that was great, you know, led the Series B. That was my partner, Mike Shu. Um, but when I look at what it takes to be a disruptor, number one, they're going after very large markets, right? Like the transportation market, the hospitality market, the energy market, right? Very large markets. Number two, they're going but after you're markets. You're referring to a growing market or an existing market? Existing Doesn't, market. Existing. Ex large existing market. Number two, they're going after large entrenched competitors in the existing market. Um, so when you combine those two things, you realize that that's what it takes. I mean, if you want to become the dominant transportation company in the world, then it takes the billions of dollars that Uber's raised. If you want to dominate, uh, become sort of the Uber for shipping, you need to do what Flexport did, go from essentially zero to you know, 1.2 billion in the bank over a three a half year period because the market's large enough to support it, but they also have very large entrenched competitors. And that's, different, that's the difference between the venture industry 30 years ago and the venture industry today. Wow, good stuff, huh? Yeah. Um, Yummy. So we're blessed to um, put $24 million in what we feel is going to be a unicorn next, probably two weeks from now. And I can talk like this because it's publicly traded. We bought, it, we bought a shell, and uh, I rang the bell on this company three months ago. And um, pretty cool stuff because getting back to 800 million, we don't need to put it. But we've gone all the way to exit and we continue buying, but it's public now. Well, 
we bought again, a lot of us. And so I looked at it a moment ago. It's SVRA, and market cap today is $388 million. And so everybody in the room, you know, it's public, so I can say these things, but I think it's going to be a unicorn. And we only put $24 million in this. And that's going to happen in June. So if I'm wrong, you can get your money out, but it could go from zero, go to zero, too. So that's the game we're in. But that's going to be pretty exciting to see that type of leverage and get to be a unicorn. And that's only about three or four weeks away. Would you guys, uh, three panelists over there, would you, when you invest, do you want the company to have a chance to be a unicorn? Or do you think, as long as I get my 5 or 10x back, that's okay? Yeah, well, I have the mic, and I'll pass it down. But we don't care about unicorns, personally, because what we care deeply about, and one of the reasons I'm here is because of strategics. I want to meet strategics all the time. I'll be in Korea next couple weeks from now as a guest of Samsung LG and you know we're interested in obviously introducing our companies and we use the exit before 100 million and then they go from there to liquidity or they have liquidity then and or they go and we get public stock in fact I'm chairman of the of the advisory board of Heritage Bank which is local we have 13 locations well they bought my bank and um, and I don't sell and I'm stupid because I love wherever I invest in and I have now 210 investments both in my funds and also personally and I I'm not a seller I mean, you are a very broad I mean foundation capital I mean they know when to exit and uh, and so if you're an investor they know and I don't I I just love my company so I just keep <laughs> investing and let it go because really but, I'm but I believe I'm selling is more important than buying Right. Right. I see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm working for my grandchildren, which I don't have any yet. I'm working for my children, and I just love the ecosystem of uh, the entrepreneurial spirit. And I will continue investing till I die because I just love. Lear my perfect day is learning, and you guys teach me a lot. Great. Great. Thank you. So, judging the time, I think uh, we all, we have a very very experienced uh, panel. But I'm going to have two more questions. The first question is to the angle about unicorn, because this is not a term that's invented uh, 20, 30 years ago, right, when foundation was founded. The other question I have to the fellow panelists is, um, if you look at uh, a, a recent study, um, last year, companies that uh, went IPO in the United States, 83% of them had negative EPS, 83%. And when did we last see statistics uh, of percentage as high as this? It was in year 99 and 2000. Um, so, and also we, we have a bio investor here. Um, a significant chunk of the company, bio companies that went IPO, of course bio have a lot of exit route, including being bought. A significant chunk of the company that are in the bio space that went IPO are negative uh, EPS, more, higher than 83%. So as entrepreneurs who are developing their business plan to pitch to the entrepreneurs, what's, if you're in a tech sector or in a bio sector, do you pitch technology, do you pitch growth, do you pitch fundraising capability, so on and so forth? And I would like to, uh, to hear the wisdom from the fellow panelists. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think uh, uh, regarding uh, what to talk about, I think I can talk about this from two different angles. First one is, uh, generally speaking, uh, yes, like in 2018, we have like 83% of the company going IPO does not uh, make any profitability. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, which is like uh, uh, reached to a uh, record high compared to uh, uh, years before. So. The first explanation is for those type of company, they choose to, they could choose to make profit if they are focusing on the short term profitability. Um, however, they, their investor also want them to instead focus on the long term uh, growth by spending more on recruiting, on hiring, and also on research. So the second uh, very interesting explanation actually is coming from the biotech company going public, the percentage of the public uh, biotech company going public. So they are very interesting. A lot of company, biotech company at this stage, they do not have any product yet. Also, they do not, let alone like uh, already can make a profitability. So 
many of them choose to go, IPO, uh, to go IPO to do the fundraising because of the expensive clinical, uh, clinical trial. So one example for the Hong Kong exchange, they allow biotech company going IPO without any revenue generation as long as their market revaluation is more than $191 million. And if you look at uh, the, some data, it would show actually one quarter of them do not uh, generate uh, any revenue at all. So in the sector of biotech uh, is really a game of like a gambling game. However, the, the successful cases also pay off very well. So if you are able to, uh, let's say, raise more than $20 million during your initial uh, offering, uh, then 30% of them were later acquired or bought out by big pharmaceutical companies. So that is a really a very unique case uh, for, for, for that. But uh, uh, of course, for the company, that can make profitability along the way will definitely also give them like a less worry when really some, for instance, a recession comes. It's important to know when to leave the casino, I think. Uh, Cash out. Yeah, yeah. And, Cash and I also, so I think if there's yeah, some basic, basic principles about uh, your business is it's got to be a big problem or it's not worth it. You've, it's got to be the right time to solve it. If you're too early, it's just as bad as being too late. And um, I think you need to have some reason about why now is the right time to do this. Some market structure, some regulatory structure, some discovery, something that makes sense. And then you gotta have the right team and, um, and you need to show how you're gonna make money. Maybe you're not profitable now, but it's gotta be very clear where that's coming. You can't just uh, kind of hope. It's gotta be really, uh, you know, just as hardcore certain that it's gonna work or you're just gambling. Okay, so quick word. I think, uh, yeah, a good point. I think uh, long term, eventually, you must generate a profit. It just uh, you, maybe different company have a different story. They can. Uh, okay, so after IPO in three years, yeah, in three years. Um, but if you have a very good story, the the uh, the CEO is so uh, you know kind of with the, le the leadership of glory or that, and maybe many investors will, uh, will help you if it doesn't longer. But eventually, it must, it must generate profit, a period. So, but uh, in, for a period of time, you know, like now, it's uh, really high. So the, you know, the public market, you know, will help uh, Lyft and Uber to, for a while. But uh, it's really, you know, hard to tell three years from now if this type of uh, company can, you know, be a very uh, welcome on the Wall Street. So, but uh, so we must we must believe in long term, you know, profitability, build business. Okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll, the curve looks like this. I, I'll use it from their perspective. The non profitability goes like this, up and down. Year 99, 2000 went up to 80 something percent. Boom! After that, dropped down to about 40 percent. Hovered around 40 percent till year 2009. And then started when QE started, went up to 83% now, you know, like a straight line. So I just want to put that into perspective. Yeah. I am not saying anything because, to be honest, uh, there's another phenomenon which I did not share. Unicorns these days actually is not created in three years. A lot of those companies uh, that uh, is uh, more than 10 years. It took a long time. But the fundraising capability seems to be very important. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I, I I will respectfully uh, disagree with my my panelists. Absolutely. On this. So there's uh, there's I would say there's kind of two buckets of companies. So one bucket of companies that that just you know work really really hard, find a way to get public, get to sort of between 500 million and five billion in market cap. 80 or 90 percent of those companies are going to get acquired by the companies that have market caps of 50 billion to 100 billion to 150 billion. They're basically just feeder companies that have become new divisions in these large companies. And so whether they're profitable at that point or not is actually kind of generally irrelevant. And the company, the large companies don't care particularly either. They care about the innovation and the potential around it. Uh, you know, witness the acquisition of VMware and other companies like that that were sort of, you know, and, and maybe over and over again in, in their case. Second part is that if you're a company that has a large enough market opportunity, and I'll, I'll go back to Netflix on this, 
But I remember when uh, Netflix went public, they went public in 2003. Okay, so that was the bottom of that, you know, the bottom of the bottom. So does anybody remember how many companies, uh, tech companies, went public in 2003? Want to take a guess? Uh, 10? Less than 10. Yeah, six, six companies went public. Netflix's market cap, 350 million. Four months later, Netflix's market cap, 180 million. All right, because all the competitors came out and were trying to take them down. So you could have bought 10% of Netflix for $18 million back then. That would have been a pretty good investment. Um, but when I think about what Reed went through quarter after quarter after quarter on the conference calls, it was when are you going to be profitable? When are you going to be profitable? When are you going to be profitable? When are you going to show more profit or any profit? That was the instruction and from you guys to them? Not at all. No, that was what the public market analysts I were see. doing because that was conventional wisdom. And Reed's point was, you don't understand how large a market I'm going after. And that's really what you're going to hear from the Flexports and the Ubers and the other people today to say, look, you don't understand. We are the disruptors that are going after the one and two digit SIC codes. We intend to be the largest companies in the world. And for that to happen, we're going to consume cash for a long time while we build that, that book of business. And you either have to buy into that or you don't. And I'm not saying you should, but you have to buy into it or you don't. From the other perspective, uh, you know, my colleague here made the, the smartest comment, I think, of the day, which is that you, know, you got to know when to leave the casino. And it's very, very difficult to look at your institutional holdings and your personal holdings and say, it's time. I've had enough. I'd rather be on the sidelines for a while. I have friends that did this two years ago, three years ago. They said, that's it. It's, it's, it's topped. They've, they've, they got out of the market two or three years ago. So they left 50% the, on the market uh, in that time period. Um, so, you know, if, if, you, if I could go back to the five business downturns I've seen in my 35-year career, I would have magically sold everything I had the day before the downturn. But it, <laughs> but it just doesn't work that way. So you have to kind of figure out your own approach to these things, uh, both institutionally and personally. But Paul, let me. Uh, this, this, since you disagree with the panelists, maybe to me, I don't know. I think we can still <laughs> remain uh, uh, be, be good friends. Um, when Ella was saying in her first uh, topic that uh, one wants to find a VC who is first here and also has deep pocket, mm -hmm. is that associative with this theme that you have about profitability? Also with uh, unicorn, you want someone who can be with you for the long term and can put tens or hundreds of million dollars into you? Or you think different VCs have different roles? I think different VCs have different roles. Yeah. Um, you know, we work with very, very high quality entrepreneurs in the past and in the present, and they choose to work with us. You know, we have a few areas that we're very deep. We're very deep in FinTech, we're deep in AI and ML, we're deep in consumer marketplaces. So we do very, very well with repeat entrepreneurs and getting people back there. Um, we're a $350 million fund, right? So we're not, it's not big. you know, we're not a money warehouse. And so they're coming to us because 70% of the time when we put money in, we're the first money in. That's been consistent since 1995. And um, they come to us because they want early stage help in forming the company and building the teams and so forth. They're not coming to us because we can write a check for $30 million at a valuation 10% more than the person down the street which is a perfectly great skill, and I think in some ways that's an easier way to make money, uh, at least when the market's going up. I will make a parenthetical comment. When you look at our, our funds or anybody else's funds, the worst funds are the ones where you uh, basically decide it's time to go late, it's time to put money into late-stage uh, projects, and you start pouring into late-stage projects, and then the market goes down. You, you might as well just literally just close the book and burn it. It's just nothing, nothing good is going to come out of that. Yeah, you, you, uh, VCs can get rich because of management fee in that case. Yeah, but that's a different yeah. argument, a different set of topics around it. If you want to be good at anything in terms of your job, you want to be good at it. And so you don't want to be the one that's pouring money into late, late, late just before the market goes down. It's, that's a, that's, great, that's great. musical chairs. Yeah, yeah. Randy, do you have any wisdom you want to share? Well, oh, Peter, sorry. Peter, I, can you rephrase the question? Oh. <laughs> Uh, you want it in Chinese again? Uh, let me look at my notes here. I was enjoying the obviously my colleagues. There's these are there's some great this wisdom. Is, uh, I forgot this is the related to um, profitability at IPO. Do you invest for profitability? 
Um, absolutely. I, I'm absolutely laser. yes or no. I, I, absolutely, I'm focused on execution, and execution yields obviously in in customers and customer yields uh, um, obviously equates into capital. I watch all the time. I'm I'd be a stupid investor right now with some of these, you know. Uber's the world because I just, you know, I, I my DNA is execution and profitability, and we're blessed, and my my business has but been profitable. Sorry, sorry, I disagree. One. I don't think execution and profitability sometimes go hand in hand, No, that's, right? that's correct. But yeah. my, my vision execution is money. Oh, okay, okay. And actually going to a customer and saying, if you believe in this, let's say, you know, they have an enterprise salesperson, he, 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 like my son's at Expanse, he just left uh, Cisco, and he's selling cybersecurity. And if he can't convince a client to pay for it, then, and, and you know, I don't think that's, uh, you, you have to be worthy. And I love that customer validation by capital. Let me uh, try to not get myself confused and put a qualifier on what you just said. You invest for execution and profitability, profitability, at IPO or post IPO, because otherwise you're going to miss 80 per, 83 percent of the no, IPO. No, definitely post. And again, our uh, you know, we've had uh, we've had 18 failures. We've had we've had uh, 123 liquidity events, and the liquidity events are all under 100 million because they're bought, being by, bought by strategics. I call them strategics, but you know, then they get absorbed, and so um, but they have executed. Let me tell you where I've lost money as an investor. Before I started at Kretsu Forum, I remember walking into a room where we underwrote them for about four million, and there was twenty six engineers there. I said, "Where's the sales and marketing? Where are the people actually selling?" And they didn't have any because that's not their DNA. So you got to make sure the CEO has the ability to hire sales and marketing people, which I love, because sales and marketing is what moves the needle in regards to an exit. Okay, so I very quickly I want to just share something I personally just learned, you know, in the in the last uh, two weeks within the last two weeks, um, about the profitability and a SaaS company, right? So we all know SaaS company, the if you have very low churn rate, right, the revenue is very high quality. That means you know 100 people pay you, they will if they are happy, they will continue to pay you, and then you only acquire new customer and adding on to it. So that's why the Wall Street, uh, you know, we have to live, we have to uh, kind of learn to accept how Wall Street, they are evolving, but how to evaluate that company. So now a SaaS company is valued very high because the SaaS company, once they meet a certain uh, matrix, and then the, the Wall Street will reward you with very high rich uh, multiples. Uh, you know, for in, uh, but typically SaaS company become a profit very late. You look at all the, you know, uh, Z Scaler or Elastic or them, all the companies you know, in SaaS, they are they achieve probability very late. But even though, as long as you have the high growth rate, the Wall Street still give you maybe 15, 20, 20 X, that kind of number. But uh, what I just learned recently was this phenomenon. If you are really, really much better than this, if you are creating profit, even you are a, f a SaaS company at a high growth, you will get rewarded much, much better. This is the, the Zoom case. It's, I read all the articles, what I missed? I think I, this is crazy. What is the thing uh, that, that some people are, write an article about? Because uh, compared with all the other SaaS companies, this company called Zoom, they have 100% growth rate versus other company when they go public, it's below 50. And then the gr that's the growth rate. And then the, uh, and then, one minute is up. yeah, okay, so. So, yeah, so that's yeah. the, also, I'm saying is that if, you, <laughs> if you created a probability, you will reward it much better. Than I, I just wanted to say also, Zoom really works. You know, it's a good product, so that's why you get that. And so I think, it, yeah, this is a big impedance matching problem. You need to match your VC. Maybe some VCs want to do build to sell, but maybe you don't. Maybe some VCs can tolerate low profitability or no profitability for a long time. You need to be in the same sync with your customer and with your investor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we only have uh, three minutes left. If I can r overrun for like uh, two, three minutes, I'd appreciate that. Whoever is uh, doing the timing here. Let's, do it. Let's just do it, right? Okay, we're bad guys. <laughs> we're uh, vulture capitalists, right? Or some. Uh, anyway, um, the last question, of course, unavoidably, I have to ask about China. Yeah. Uh, we have entrepreneurs and also representatives from China. We have VCs who came from China. And uh, with the tension, um, do you still want to aggressively have a China strategy? If so, what might that be? 
I'm putting it at as high a level as that. As that. Yeah, I do. Oh. Yeah, quickly, I, I do. Um, I, I, we've been in China for 10 years, but uh, sadly we lost our, our, our president. Um, and, um, and so we're looking for leadership. And uh, the job description of that leadership is someone can build and, uh, and retain a community of investors that care deeply about entrepreneurs. And we have 3,600 members around the world, and, and uh, we're remiss not being in China. We're, we circle it. We're in Singapore. Um, we're in South Korea. We're in four locations, India. But we definitely want to come back uh, uh, to India. Uh, so we've never had a presence on the ground in China. Uh, it just hasn't been part of our strategy. We're uh, Silicon Valley based and we're pretty small um, from that perspective. Uh, we do have Chinese limited partners. Uh, they've been terrific. Uh, I typically go over like once a year and give a talk at the entrepreneur conferences, wherever it might happen to be. Um, you know, China is going to be one of, if not the biggest growth engine for the global economy over the next 50 years or so. So I think it's, it's impossible to ignore um, from that perspective. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, quick, really, really quickly, okay, probably. Yeah, I think uh, uh, our strategy is treated as a two markets. I don't uh, mix, the, mix the up. That's our view, yeah. I think there's a big opportunity to take uh, companies with proven IP or trade secrets in a midsize and do distributions with true Chinese companies where they have some exclusivity to that market and you're protected through agreements so the incentives are right and the people are right. And that's the big opportunity till things change there. Or here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so uh, yes, since uh, like mid-2017, there are more and more uh, tension between U.S. and China regarding like the, the patent issue, the, the trade issue. However, when you like talking about it from uh, international trade uh, the whole globe is actually uh, on one stage. And actually also when you're looking at this, all this uh, transaction number of the cross-border deal uh, happening in 2018, actually the number hit also record high compared to uh, years before. And there's also a number talking about uh, 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 about this deal going on. But one interesting thing, one thing I think I worth to mention is when you look at the number. So, so when you look at the transaction, Active uh, transaction, the cross border activity happening in 2018, 63 percent of them actually are happening from the U.S. based uh, investor and the China based uh, company, which is a perfect reverse of what happened in 2016, when 63 percent of the cross border activity happening between Chinese investor, Chinese, uh, China-based investor, and a U.S.-based uh, company. So this is also something like uh, worth uh, people also to think about it. Uh, so my opinion, my opinion is uh, uh, like in some way, uh, the VC investor from both of U.S. and also China, they 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 sort of like still put aside this uh, political issue because they're still see seeing the money making as the absolute goal. Um, and also, in my view, this uh, 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 all this like uh, 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 tension uh, like uh, between uh, China and the, and the U.S. They they are uh, eventually they will also ease off, and then we just like need to uh, have a like a uh, better prepare for it. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm going to steal one more minute, and that minute I'll I'll give it to you, Eugene. You can pick one audience for one question. Yeah. Don't state your comments, but please, if you have a question, raise your hand. You you did that first. My question goes to the Kerry two folks. Um, so you have you keep the company of such gentlemen and ladies who you know have raised unicorns, have so much money. So why is it that you guys charge entrepreneurs for coming to pitch to these guys? And it's like hefty fees of three to five k. Most of startups, especially in social impact. No, no, we got your we got your question. Let me answer it. Um, be because we have 364 members uh, um, um, in the Bay Area. We have staff of seven, and our, our members want later stage. And it's a great litmus test. Um, we have a lot of wonderful dreamers out there, but they're not yet ready for us. And so we are only um, bringing in 50 companies a month, 
um, come to us and we only choose four. If we're in this for profit, we'd have 50 companies presenting. The whole spirit of it is uh, we don't take any warrants or commissions, never will. We've never had a lawsuit in 18 years. And so, yes, there is an administrative fee to present, but there's nothing else. And so um, we're very proud of our model and we're the largest network in the world of what we do. This is great. Okay. Um. Am I allowed to have one more question? Let's see you're saying. Uh, am I allowed to have one more question or no? Okay. Very quickly. Uh, the most recent technology is the uh, internet, which is uh, 30 years old. Behind, uh, after that was the four patents I filed in 1990, 2000. I keep submitting my business plan to VCs. VCs said my company is too early, uh, and I told VC, VCs have only one choice, invest in me or lose money. Uh, 20 years later, we say keep losing money. How long you want to go? <laughs> Anyone want to take that? VC is uh, if we don't invest money, we don't. We will not lose money. We will lose an oppor We will lose an opportunity, but not lose money. Yeah. 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 Anyone want to take that? No. Nope. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I personally learned a lot from this uh, this panel. Thank you guys very much, and thank you for being here.